I am going to talk first, my name is Graham Farrell, about um, the international crime drop and the security hypothesis. This is going to be followed by um, Andrew Mackey Saloni, over there, um, who's going to talk about the association between burglary and effective house security, individual household and area mediating factors. Nick Tilley is then going to talk about did security cause the drop in domestic burglary? It's advertised as me talking for that, but it's, it, that was just a, a mistake somewhere along the line. It's Nick who's going to present that. Um, and then I'm going to talk close with, by talking about did security cause the violent crime drop? Um, we have a range of co-authors on each of the papers, including Emily Evans, Rebecca Thompson, Louise Grove, and Sunita Gampat, I believe who are part of the team that we've worked with over the years in putting this research together. And we realized, I think we started this work we're going to talk about in about 2006. And um, this is the first time Nick, Mackey and I have presented together on any of it, I think. So it's nice and um, an opportunity for me to thank them for, for the enjoyable work we've been involved in over the years. It's um, no longer really news to acknowledge that there's been an international crime drop, I don't think. It's fairly well known. Most high-income countries have experienced some form of drop in crime. There's been quite a significant variation in how, in how it has occurred. It's occurred for different times, for different crime types in different countries. Uh, the, it was first probably acknowledged and studied in the United States where violent crime plummeted from 1991 onwards. In the UK, although property crime in the US had been going down since probably the late 70s as well, burglary and theft. Other property crime, vehicle crime in particular, went down slightly in advance of violent crime in the US and it has a very similarly downward trajectory to violence in the US, which, which is um, an interesting feature. In the, in the UK, crime peaked in 1992, particularly property crimes, which was the, which, the bulk of crime being property crime, started going down dramatically in 1992 and is still going down. Violent crime peaked slightly later, about 95, and has been going down since. And a similar story, to the extent we know from the data, seems to have occurred in many, many countries. I just I unfortunately missed Jack Ward's presentation about the Netherlands yesterday. And, but he's just given me some amazing data showing similar trends in the Netherlands where they've got excellent data. Um, we know this from the French crime survey. The international crime survey shows it for many, m most of Europe, to the extent we tell. A notable exception, please correct me if I'm long, wrong, is Sweden, where the National Council for Crime Prevention, and this is directly from the current website, says the, the Swedish Crime Survey confirms the police reports that suggesting that crime has continued to increase in Sweden. Um, there might be a fascinating study in there. I don't, I, I, I don't know enough about um, what's happened in Sweden. It would be particularly interesting to see um, what's happened really in relation to vehicle crime, whether there's been similar spread of vehicle security that's occurred in other countries. It's actually a great potential research opportunity if crime hasn't gone down in Sweden. If anyone is here from Sweden and would, be, would like to have coffee with me, I'm buying. I've done some research in Canada where it appears that the crime trends are very similar to those in the United States to a large extent. Although, actually, the, the, the Canadian National Victimization Survey doesn't, hasn't teased this out as, as well. And there was quite, um, there still is probably some um, disbelief in, within Canada that crime has been going down. 
that I think there was a sampling problem with the National Crime Survey that means it hasn't detected it as well as it's shown in, in recorded crime. The recorded crime mirrors that, the, the, the rates in the states. I noticed several um, presentations that I'm looking forward to tomorrow, including one on Japan and Chile, where I don't know the data. I suspect they're about crime having gone down in similar fashions. So first thing, tomorrow morning. There have been a, a number of hypotheses offered to try and explain crime over the years, from imprisonment, policing, I'm not going to go through them all. Some of them are more novel, some are far more creative than others, some of them are fairly traditional explanations. A lot of them, quite a few of them emerged in relation to US research, a lot of the pioneering research on the crime drop occurred in the United States, but to some extent that also meant um, some of the explanations were focused almost solely on the US, things like gun laws, the death penalty, legalization of abortion. When you begin to take this in an international context, it becomes fairly clear that they can't have explained the change in crime in other countries. Generally speaking, um, there's, the evidence tends to suggest that these explanations don't, I, I don't think, that it's, there are, it's still open to discussion to some extent. I don't think there is strong evidence supporting many of these hypotheses. And I'm not going to go into it in detail here. The internet, for example, has been raised, but the, the internet was first made publicly available by, available by America Online in 1994. Crime had already been going down for several years before that. Also, the internet, if you remember, having dial-up modems, and it took a long time to spread, particularly amongst those parts of the society where crime was being committed, probably didn't have good access to the internet for many years. So whether that had the influence on lifestyle or possibilities for changing crime in the way that sometimes has been suggested is another, another question. I don't think it, it did. It may have had some kind of uh, more of a consolidation effect in recent years. A study by Alex Piquero suggested that phone, phone guardianship, which is an interesting hypothesis, the rise of phones in the 1990s, did that provide guardianship to people who could have the capacity to mobilize the police more readily in whatever situation? And they actually didn't find any support for the hypothesis, really. So our research, the research agenda we've been pursuing in relation to security, um, evolved through discussions saying where is, where's the role, where's, what's been the role of situational crime prevention, rational choice theory in this discussion about why crime is going down. Who, who has used the crime-specific approaches to try and address the problem? And nobody really had, from what we could tell. There have been suggestions of this. Um, the, the first sources where we've identified this, this discussion originating are in the work of Ron Clark, particularly in a, a short discussion in a book he published with Graham Newman, and in the work of Jan van Dijk around 2006, both of those seem to the origins of the discussion, and we, we've developed this into research, into what we've framed as the security hypothesis, which has four core components. We've been investigating the notion that security improved, and more, more and better security. We've been looking at how more and better security has reduced crime through increasing the actual and perceived risk and effort it needs to commit crime. Clearly, different security devices impact differently upon different crime types in different contexts, which is why it's good to have the overarching theoretical framework of rational choice, routine activities, the crime opportunity theory framework. What we've also found so far, and consistent with the literature and what 
Kate Bowers and Shane Johnson were talking about yesterday is that there seems to be little or no displacement. And we'd also, and I'll talk further about this later, tend to think there's increasing evidence of a, of a diffusion of benefits from security to other areas, including violent crime. As part of this, this panel, we're going to go through the different crime types, and I'm going to close by talking about violent crime, where it's still very much exploratory and early days, looking at how the, how the effects of security may have occurred. And we think one possible avenue, there's various possible different avenues in which a diffusion of benefits may have occurred. That may have occurred. So we adopted a, a crime-specific problem-solving approach. We started um, with probably the best data source available, the, the British Crime Survey, Crime Survey for England and Wales, as it's called now, which is, we think, the best data source around. And we started by looking at vehicle theft, insofar as that was also missing from the discussion. But as it was, for us, the, the easiest crime to start with. And we developed, the approach was to develop a range of data signatures. That was a quote from Ekam, Ekam Madison, who, who wrote a paper about the, the value of data signatures in research evaluation. And we developed a range of indicators, all of which triangulate to suggest that security, improvements in vehicle security have had a significant effect upon vehicle theft, in particular central locking systems, mechanical immobilizers, electronic immobilizers, alarms, to some extent, appear to have had a significant effect upon vehicle crime. And there are an increasing number of studies now in different countries that appear to have replicate, repl replicated these effects. I think, um, to some extent, it will always be questionable. We, we acknowledge that uh, there was a number of other things going on at the time on which we don't have information. That, you know, Nick did research in the 90s on crime in car parks, where there have been a lot of developments in, in the management of car parks, parking lots, and other aspects relating to of design relating to vehicle crime, design of the environment, as well as the, in addition to the vehicles themselves. But to the extent we can tell, Security and combinations of security devices in particular have had a significant effect. Um, the, the combinations is also something I think Nick will come back to when he talks about household security. And it's a particularly important aspect that um, where you have more than one device, the protective effect seems to be significantly greater, disproportionately greater. So, and where you've got three or four security devices, the level of security conferred, again, varying by device type, is far greater than for individual devices. Again, the research is not perfect. There can be confounding effects. because It's difficult to tease out the different ones. But it, but it all seems to tie together. Um, so we've found for different types of vehicle crime, different devices work differently. Alarms, for example, have a great, had a greater effect upon theft from vehicles, I think it was, than they did for theft of vehicles, whereas vehicle immobilizers appear to have greater effect upon theft of vehicles than theft from vehicles. For each device, the, the data suggested that it made sense in relation to the, the theoretical mechanism by which those devices should prevent crime. So this notion of the security device effectiveness, and we develop ratings, which we call the SPF, the security protection factor, seem to tie in with all the other indicators. In Australia, there was a particularly interesting, almost natural experiment where Western Australia introduced vehicle immobilizers in advance of the rest of the country and also had a decline in vehicle theft in advance of the rest of the country. 
all things seem to tie together. So I'm going to, um, as, we've, as we've developed this research, it also seems to have become increasingly apparent that as security gets better and more effective, it also becomes more elegant in other ways. And we developed a little acronym I want to introduce to you that captures these, the characteristics of what we've been terming elegant security. Um, increasingly, security is, is the default amongst when security is good. So on vehicles, modern vehicles, the default is, is it secure, whereas it used to be that the vehicle was insecure, and in particular, you had to take, spend a lot of time and effort to secure each door individually, to add a, add a, a new steering wheel brace or crook lock, and now you um, press a single button and the whole vehicle is secure. Good security is, is increasingly aesthetically neutral or pleasant. We've noticed at the time that crime has been going down and good security has been increasing, that poor security, ine inelegant security, has been on the decline. So bars and grills on households have been declining, while good quality window locks and door locks have been increasing. Likewise with cars, the uglier aspects of, of security have been in decline when the better quality security has increased. Good security has a more powerful preventive mechanism. It's increasingly principled, which ties in with the being less offensive to everyone except offenders. I think, I think we're moving away from the notion of fortress society. I think fortress society is pr proving largely unfounded in many key, key aspects of security. Good security is effortless. You walk away from a vehicle now and it often automatically locks when you've left it alone for a few seconds. The default in most households now is that the, the door locks, the windows are closed and locked automatically. And it's cost effective. So the, the acronym is DAPA for elegant security. And it's almost a... I think it's very important in terms of um, society and when we raise notions of security, it often gets a negative reaction from people. And what we're finding is that security that's elegant is also increasingly acceptable in society. It's particularly when it's the default option. It should be that you don't leave a crime opportunity or don't generate a crime opportunity if you can avoid it. So that was my... Short introduction. Oh, that was published in a piece that we co-authored with Ron. He's over there, which is very nice. Um, so I'm going to hand over to is it Mackie or Nick now. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Do you want me to do it? No. no. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, all right. Okay, um, picking up from what Graham just said, um, we have tried to work out whether security played a part in producing uh, the drop in domestic burglary in England and Wales. This is a piece of work that was done by all of us, Graham, um, Mackie and myself, who've been involved in this series of projects all along. And as far as the burglary work is concerned, um, Becky Thompson and Emily Evans also played uh, a large part in, in the work I'm going to talk about. Um, these are the things I'm going to be pointing out. One is that there has been a dramatic fall in domestic burglary. And secondly, Graham talked about the sorts of signatures that we'd expect if security were to be playing a part in producing a drop in crime of specific sorts. And what we'd expect if security had played a part in producing the drop in burglary is that there should be higher levels of security fewer households without security, some increase in the efficacy of the security devices which are installed due to the improvements in quality. We'd expect that uh, security devices, in particular combinations of security devices, would become 
more effective. And uh, we'd expect to drop in burglaries that involved the overcoming of security devices. And I'm going to talk about the data that we've collected that speak to each of these. First of all, this is just to say that uh, burglary, according to the Crime Survey of England and Wales, has dropped very substantially uh, from the early 1990s. From, um, and uh, both attempted burglary and burglary with entry have dropped substantially. What I'm going to be talking about is only burglary with entry on the grounds that attempted burglary at least can be considered, at least in some cases, to be a function of successful burglary prevention devices which have prevented entry actually being gained. So I'm going to be talking exclusively about uh, the drop in burglary with entry. So has there been more security and less insecurity? Well, these are the patterns according to the Crime Survey of England and Wales, which asks about the security devices which have been installed. And what it shows is that there has been being a steady increase in levels of most forms of security, with some notable exceptions. Uh, there's a, been a drop in the proportion of households with security chains, bolts and bars, and there's been something of a decline in the proportion of households with window bars and grills, just those sorts of fortress-focused, ugly and exclusionary forms of security which... Um, Graham uh, alluded to earlier. But there have been more, more, um, more alarms about which a little later, uh, more window locks and more double locks and deadlocks, which turn out to be significant in ways that we'll talk about in due course. There's been a huge decline in the proportion of households which have no security. And we can see this, although the, 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 the numbers jump up and down a bit. The overall trend is clear enough. There's been a uh, a, a huge decline in the proportion of households in England and Wales which have no security devices or none of the security devices about which questions have been asked in the relevant surveys, uh, irrelevant uh, sweeps of the Crime Survey of England and Wales. So security has increased, uh, levels of insecurity have decreased, or the proportions of households without security have uh, decreased. Um, this tells us that some security devices are better than others. The first two window locks and door, indoor lights, these, these, the, these, these findings are not statistically significant at the 5% level, which, uh, but the rest of them are statistically significant. And these show what the effects are where a single device is installed. What we've used here is the, the SIAT refers to the security impact assessment tool, which is what we use to estimate the security prevention factor which Graham talked about earlier. And basically what this does is to compare the probability of households with no security in relation to, those, to the total population of households to those with particular security devices or sets of security devices in relation to all households and looks at the ratio of the one to the other. And basically it shows that households with external lights are three times safer than those without um, without um, security devices, without any kind of security devices. More interestingly, what we find is that combinations of security device are particularly effective. And the effectiveness, in most cases, exceeds the, added, the addition of the security factors for the individual um, um, devices. So that um, uh, the, the, more devices confers um, increased levels of security over and above that which would be expected through the addition of one security device to another. Um, what this shows is that uh, those households with... Um, that the burglary rates for... Uh, um, the burglary with entry for households with no security has increased very substantially between... 92 to 96, with a, and then in particular from 02 to 05 to 09 to, to 12. Uh, uh, and those with um, window and door locks, uh, the, the, the rates have, have gone down. Um, if we look now at the sets of security devices across... Here we've taken five sweeps of the British Crime Survey in order to, cr to create a sufficiently large sample to look at the relative effectiveness of different suites of security device. And what this shows is that um, the security devices that include that are, that are, that are, that are wide, which include um, window locks, uh, uh, double door locks, 
internal acts and external acts are especially affected. We've got a security protection factor here of 49, which indicates that those households which have this suite of security devices are 49 times less likely to be subject to burglary with entry than those which have um, no security devices. Um, and what we can see here is that the security combinations which are particularly efficacious have increased in, it, it, they've become increasingly common across the population of all households uh, over the periods of the, of, of the crime saving in Wales since uh, 1998. And if we regress back in relation to those security device type combinations which have been most efficacious, we can see that they've increased very substantially over the period of the, of the crime drop, of the drop in, 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 in domestic burglary. What the Crime Survey of England and Wales doesn't ask about is double glazing. But double glazing um, improves the security of households, and it's this which has increased really quite dramatically between 1996 and 2008, from something uh, around 30% of households uh, which are entirely double glazed, uh, in, in something like 30% in 1996, and something over 70% in 2008. So over the period of the crime drop, there's been a massive increase in the proportion of households which have a double glazing, and that's coincided with a very substantial drop in the, uh, in the burglaries per thousand households um, uh, as, as measured through the Crime Survey of England and Wales. And we, we, we don't know because the data don't allow us to, to be competent of this, but we suspect that the increase in double glazing has increased the security of households in England and Wales very substantially. Uh, largely because it's harder to break into households with double panes, partly because there have been a, there's been a standard set for double glazing which prevents, it, but prevents the uh, outer pane being easily prized open, um, and partly because uh, locks are, uh, good locks are, uh, tend to be uh, included for the doors in double glazed houses. So we think that this is an aspect of security improvement which wasn't introduced in order to improve security, but as a as a side effect of the improvement in double glazing, security has increased in ways which may have played quite a substantial part in producing the drop in burglary. If we look now at the methods of entry, what we see here is that it's forced entry burglaries which have declined most substantially, and it's forced entry burglaries which can be prevented through improvements in security. Unforced entry burglaries haven't really changed so very much. So this suggests that it's the security, that it's security devices which can impede forced entry have been effective in producing the reduction. If we now look specifically at entry via doors, again we can see forced, where the entry has been forced through the door, the reduction, there's been a substantial reduction in the proportion of burglaries whereas those where there has been unforced door entry, in other words, where the door's been left uh, open or where it's, it, 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 the, 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 the decline is, is much less marked. Um, much the same goes for um, window, uh, for, for forced entry via windows. Forced entry via windows has dropped very substantially. Unforced entry via windows hasn't dropped uh, very much at all. If we look overall, at means of entry, we can see that the forced entry, uh, 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 forced entry methods have declined much more significantly than others, and it's these forced entries which are effectively, uh, which can be impeded through the improvements in, in security. Um, if we look now at whether or not anybody was at home at the time of the burglary, um, uh, what we can see here is that the drop has mainly been in burglaries where nobody has been at home, uh, and it's here that um, the security devices are liable to have been set when people leave the home rather than when they are at home. So all of those findings suggest that the improvements in there has been a substantial improvement in security, that we've had an increased effective, we've had inc uh, uh, security combinations uh, have become more common, that the security combinations which effectively stop burglary have increased in particular, and we see the methods used to gain, we've seen that the drop has mainly been in burglaries whose 
uh, methods would involve overcoming security, uh, suggesting that the improvements in security have led to the reductions. There is a paradox in all of this that relates to burglar alarms. Here we've looked at the marginal effects of the introduction of a burglar alarm in relation to other devices that are installed in households. And we looked at the sets of sweeps from 1992 to 1996 and the sets of sweeps from 2008 to 2012. And what's remarkable, striking, and I think we think quite interesting about this, is that between 1992 and 1996, the addition of a burglar alarm to other security devices improved the security of the household, reduced the probability of, of burglary. Um, but in the latter period, between 2008 to 2012, the addition of a burglar alarm seems to have made households less, less secure. It seems to have, uh, so the risk of burglary is greater amongst households where alarms have been added. So if we take us, the, the, we, just, just to make clear, what this measures is the marginal effect of the addition of a burglar alarm to, an, to any other suite of security devices with an improvement in security, a reduction in burglary risk in the early period, but a decrease in risk, an increase in burglary in the later period. Um, and this is a curious finding. Uh, burglar alarms have quite a lot of surface validity. Um, they're also uh, widely recommended by insurance companies uh, uh, once uh, people have suffered burglary. Um, so we wondered what's going on. Various explanations are possible. It could be that their data are misleading or that there's a respondent error. We don't think either of these is very likely. The Crime Survey England and Wales is a very well-conducted survey. The questions relate to the but to the security devices which were in place at the time that the burglary took place. So it might have been suspected that these, this was a function of the fact that the, question, that the burglary alarm was um, installed after the burglary. Not so. These were the, burg the, the devices that were in place at the time at which the burglary took place. There may be a latent repeat victim, victim function in the sense that the burglar alarm might have been fitted after one burglary that took place in the previous year to the year about with the questions asked in the crime survey. Um, and the likelihood, uh, in the experience of the burglary, increases the likelihood of a subsequent burglary, and that subsequent burglary might be a function of the earlier burglary uh, rather than a, 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 a function of the, the, the presence of an alarm. Um, we, might, we, we, we did wonder whether offenders had learnt that burglar alarms don't do much good. There's been some kind of offender adaptation. But burglar alarms don't comprise any kind of physical obstacle to committing a burglary. And burglars might have figured out that the risks to them are not much increased if a burglar alarm is fitted. We wondered whether burglar alarms might be treated as flags that there was something worth pinching. Uh, we did wonder whether uh, burglar alarms had been uh, discredited uh, um, because of the very large numbers which had been installed, uh, which ceased to make them a distinctive feature which enabled burglars to distinguish between uh, better and worse places to, um, to commit burglary. And we did wonder whether burglar alarms are not all the same, and what we'd got is the installation of third-rate burglar alarms, which are not very effective. So there are various kinds of explanations. Um, this is one way of trying to think through uh, what went on. Um, and I guess this, um, for, for me, this would be the leading contender, but I, we don't have any data to, 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 to test these alternative explanations for these rather paradoxical findings about burglar alarms. Um, but certainly in the earlier period, burglar alarms were relatively rare. We've seen that there's been a very substantial increase in the proportion of households in England and Wales fitted with burglar alarms. And there is qualitative research, ethnographic research, that suggests that, burglar, that offenders read burglar alarms in some respects as an indicator that risks are too great to commit a burglary, and in some ways as an indicator that there are goods worth pinching. Uh, we also know that at the earlier period, the police would routinely attend if a burglar alarm sounded. Um, and under these sorts of circumstances, we, 
it, it, it may be that the risk signal trigger, it trumped the, the rich pickings signal conferred by a burglar alarm um, and led to a reduction in the risk for those households which had alarms fitted in addition to any other uh, security devices they had in place. In the second period, burglar alarms had become really pretty, wide, pretty commonplace, often a requirement of insurance. The police, because of the very high rate of false alarms, stopped attend have stopped attending um, households where burglar alarms sound routinely. Um, so the chances of catching, of being caught committing a burglary become even less if they don't attend if a burglar alarm sounds. Um, so if that's the case, uh, risks to uh, offenders will, will fall. So the, in, the increased risk from a burglar alarm will be decreased as a result of the non-routine non attendance by police officers. And under these circumstances, we wonder whether there might be a tendency for rich pickings to trump uh, increased risk in relation to the presence of a burglar alarm. And so in the second period, the marginal effect of burglar alarms um, becomes negative. As I say, we have no way of testing um, this as a hypothesis about what leads to the paradoxical findings about burglar alarms, but they are nevertheless um, quite interesting. Anyway, in conclusion, the improvements in security appear indeed to have had a direct impact on burglary, domestic burglary levels or domestic burglary with entry, uh, levels of burglary uh, with entry. Um, the Crime Survey in England and Wales sadly doesn't identify all security-related changes. In particular, it doesn't ask about uh, double glazing. <coughs> it doesn't ask about the quality of security or security behavior. Graham talked earlier about the improvements in the quality of security device. We don't have in the Crime Survey of England and Wales any indicator of the quality of the devices that are fitted. Um, and certainly when we've talked to um, police officers, um, uh, who are involved in providing advice about security. Their view is that the quality of security devices has increased quite a lot. And their concern is that burglar alarms, in particular, are do-it-yourself installed. Burglar alarms are not very high quality, and this might, in their view, explain the uh, reduced effectiveness or the fact that they no longer confer any, any um, uh, improved security. Um, in practical terms... Um, wide devices, window locks, good door locks, internal lights and external lights, appear to be a cheap but effective way of preventing domestic burglary. And um, our conclusion, I guess, for policymakers and practitioners is that if they are concerned with trying to reduce levels of domestic burglary, this suite of devices are not very expensive and could well be targeted at the high-risk high households if we were interested in Reducing, uh, in reducing domestic burglary. Um, I, I, I won't uh, m um, go into this, but um, Graham again talked about a diffusion of benefits from improvements in security, and we do think that in relation to um, uh, uh, debut offences or gateway offences like um, car theft and domestic burglary, and for that matter, um, um, uh, shop theft, um, improvements in security may have inhibited the onset of criminal careers which have a spin-off effect in terms of other forms of criminal behaviour. Um, we also, I won't go into Keystone, which is more, 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 more perhaps relevant to car theft, um, but also we, we wonder whether the reduced, the reduced opportunities for easy um, acquisitive crime uh, may also have inhibited the development of drug habits, which themselves then um, produce their own crime consequences. Anyway, Mackie. Uh, right. Right, so um, following on the same line as my uh, previous uh, 
uh, the previous speakers. Thank you very much for coming this morning to start with. I'm going to concentrate um, on another topic uh, now that we've seen the general uh, picture on who actually was better off or worse off after the crime drop, uh, especially with regards to uh, beggar risk. And this work I'm going to uh, concentrate, focus on uh, this morning, uh, is um, all based on a very... Um, very um, um, large uh, work of statistical modeling analysis done by uh, Rebecca Thompson. Um, and the other parts of the, um, of the research projects, um, apart from uh, Graham and Nick, is also uh, Louise Grove. So the outline is just talking a little bit more about the wider risk process, telling you details that Graham and Nick didn't mention, uh, and then to show the general burger trends in data, how we split the data to analyze them, um, then perhaps skipping Wiesberger's keep the device to work because Nick already talked about it, and then talk about uh, who they work for and under what context. So the work started in 2007 or 2006, and that's a classical example of situation research collaboration. Graham and Nick uh, were living in Nottingham at the time, and I was due to move to Nottingham. Uh, and so they thought that was a nice way of um, um, welcoming me uh, back to the UK after a long time in the States and uh, Greece. Uh, so uh, the, 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 the aspect uh, we took in examining the crime drop was crime type and context specific uh, approach um, and at that time uh, the context was actually uh, the country because we examined most of the international crime uh, victim survey uh, data. Uh, then the second part of the, um, this research agenda is the burglary drop that we focused more uh, this morning. And the current uh, part is looking at the role of uh, routine activities and personal security uh, in uh, the violence uh, drops that have been observed in England and Wales. And this is, uh, we're going to touch upon it uh, tomorrow morning in another session. But this is uh, yet in early stages, so don't get too excited about it. Um, this is the burglary uh, trends again, as you saw. Uh, back in uh, 1993, about 7% of households were at risk of burglary, and by 2004-2005, it was 2% of households. So the prevalence rate actually uh, dropped uh, about three times. Uh, the crime survey in England and Wales is a fantastic um, source of um, crime, um, occurrences and attitudes towards crime uh, in England and Wales, uh, but it doesn't have consistent questions uh, over time, especially during the earlier times. So in the earlier times, uh, there were only questions about burger alarms, deadlocks, uh, window locks, and whether the house had any lights uh, at the time of the burglary, and also for the general population. Uh, from, from 1998 onwards, uh, the list of security devices increased to eight, and most notably, they separate between external lights that work on a sensor and internal lights uh, that work on a timer. Uh, from 2008-2009 onwards, they added uh, the existence of CCTV camera, which, of course, is a very expensive uh, security device and still uh, is only uh, prevalent to about 0.4% uh, of the population uh, surveyed of England and Wales. Uh, somehow, uh, both the trends in burglary, uh, which um, seemed to stabilize after 2004-2005, as well as the existence of the different security devices, defined how we had to merge the data uh, to have enough cases for um, statistical significance. And so we used the 1992 to 1996 sweeps uh, in one go. The 1998 and 2000 were the sharpest uh, decline was observed. Then 2001 up to uh, March 2005, uh, etc. April 2005 to March 2008, and then April 2008 uh, to March uh, 2012. So these are the sets of data that have been um, examined during the project. And the first question was, which burger security devices work? And that's been already addressed uh, by uh, Nick. And the methodology was a security impact assessment tool, which was already developed um, to measure the car um, theft um, security protection um, in a paper uh, by Farrell and the rest of us of 2011. 
Uh, but for, with regards to burglary, it's been explained in a more recent paper in 2014 in the Security Journal, uh, which is open access. Um, this is the same graph as you saw with Nick, and as you might see, if you have the four combination of CCTV, security change window and drawer locks, you're slightly better off than having the white combination, uh, but then the cost um, is actually not worth it, and also security chains uh, are a fire hazard or an accident hazard, and they can only be operated if you are in the house. So overall, for practical uh, purposes, uh, the window and door locks, internal and external lights, um, are something that can be easily um, uh, fitted. Now, but what's really important here is um, who has benefited more uh, from upgrades in security uh, during the crime drop. And in order to test that, we had to run like a series of um, bivariate, in a sense not just two variables, but two dependent variables. In other words, joint hierarchical uh, model, models of burglary risk and the prevalence of um, wide security across various high school characteristics. And in a sense, the way that you saw the security protection factors, we can say that this could... Uh, notionally um, be defined as contextual, contextualized security impact uh, assessment tool. In other words, uh, whether security devices work for specific uh, population groups. Here is an example uh, um, which is based on models from 2008-2009 to 2010-2011 um, crime survey for Inga and Wales, where the one, um, the one um, value of the y-axis uh, shows the risk, the basic risk for owner occupiers. Uh, anything above that shows higher risk, everything below shows lower risk. And there are also two parts of the bar. The red part uh, shows the burglar risk. And you see that um, the first bar as well is, refers to social renters, and the second bar refers to private renters. So you see, for example, that social renters have uh, nearly 200% uh, more um, higher rates of burglary than our occupiers, but 73% lower rates um, of uh, having uh, the white combination than owner occupiers. So the blue part of the bar um, shows the relative uh, presence or absence, and because below one is absence uh, in this case, um, of the white combination. Uh, private renters, on the other hand, have similar uh, lack of white security compared to owner occupiers, uh, but much less um, odds of burglary risk uh, the, um, compared to social renters, still higher than owner occupiers, about 37% um, higher. So this is uh, what um, I would call context contextualized um, security protection uh, factor because it takes into account um, who the protection is afforded to. So we've run, as I said, a set of models and we established these uh, contextualized um, security protection factors over time. Um, and this is... Uh, an, uh, well, I hope, simple way of presenting that. Uh, the various bars um, on this sort, on this part, all refer to social tenants, uh, or in other words, uh, public housing or council housing uh, tenants. And this refers to private rented uh, tenants. Uh, anything below one, again, is having less of what it's indicated compared to owner-occupiers. Everything above one is having more compared to owner-occupiers. Uh, the red uh, part of the bar uh, refers to burglary risk. The blue part of the bar uh, refers to a uh, presence of uh, wide security. And what's really startling is that, as you might remember, the burglary risk uh, from uh, 1993 uh, down to 2011-2012 uh, was reduced uh, nearly three times. However, it seems that for uh, social renters uh, or uh, public housing uh, tenants, the relative burglary risk has gone up uh, three times compared to owner occupiers. So in a sense, burglary risk has gone massively down, but it's also more concentrated now on very specific 
specific socioeconomic groups. And this is, I think, a very important lesson for situational crime prevention because you can focus resources uh, onto um, a limited and well-defined uh, um, population um, population. Um, community uh, to uh, reduce burglary even further or even eliminate it. Um, another interesting uh, characteristic there is that um, the presence of white security hasn't been any more uh, for social uh, tenants compared to uh, homeowners. And this is again surprising uh, because safety, um, crime and safety uh, partnerships, especially in England and Wales, have invested a lot um, in their social housing, but obviously uh, not enough. Uh, therefore, um, during the period of the crime drop, there's been a sustained gap uh, in the presence of effective security uh, between owner occupiers and the um, other population groups with regards to tenure. Now, the shading of the bars uh, indicates the statistical significance, and obviously when it is um, more palely shady, it means that the effect is not statistically significant. So, for example, for private renters, uh, they weren't any more at risk of burglary compared to owner occupiers uh, prior to 2008-2009, uh, but they have become more at risk um, in the most recent sweeps of the uh, crime survey for England Wales. So, again, this is worrying. At the time of a burglary drop, you see certain population groups to, to become more at risk uh, compared to others than um, earlier on, where the burglary risk was, um, if you like, more uh, diffused. This is a very clear cut, um, in my opinion, um, outcome um, of security and how it might affect the relative effect of burglar risk, but it's not always the case. Uh, for example, here we have the various um, burglar risk and uh, wide availability um, estimates um, according to ethnicity. Uh, the first set of bars refers to a population of um, African, uh, Caribbean, um, or African-American uh, origin. Uh, the second, uh, to people of um, Indian, Bangladeshi, um, uh, Pakistani origin. And the last one is mixed Chinese, or rather, because there aren't enough cases in the crime safe way, so we uh, tend to uh, compound them. And what we see for a black population, the burglaries was higher at the height uh, of the um, burglary um, crime rates, but nowadays they're not any more at risk uh, compared to whites. Um, again, the comparison group is a uh, white population. And similarly, in terms of their security, they don't have any less security compared to the white population. By contrast, when you look at Asian or um, a mixed Chinese or other, they seem that uh, they have a higher burglar risk compared to white uh, during the crime drop, um, and um, they have also lower white availability compared to whites. And another interesting um, definition of population group is with regards to area of residence uh, in a city, which is the first set of bars, urban, the, set, uh, the second set uh, of bars. And we see there that um, they um, are in a city and the basis uh, population group is uh, rural uh, households. Uh, we see there that um, all uh, inner city and urban uh, population groups have both more burglar risk and a more white presence compared uh, to rural households. So there doesn't seem to be a, a straightforward uh, association uh, between uh, presence of security and burglar risk, which could be uh, down to, for example, uh, proximity uh, to potential offenders, uh, population density, uh, etc. But we see that um, rural households seem to be trying to catch up in terms of uh, securitization uh, of their households that they don't necessarily uh, need to. So far, um, only population groups were examined. Now we're going to bring into pic um, the picture uh, the type of area that uh, people live. Um, and that's been uh, based on similar models that also took uh, into account area characteristics based on the census uh, data. So an independent set of information uh, than, than the crime survey for England and Wales. Um, 
as you um, may know, uh, when you uh, have to deal with lots of qualitative characteristics, you need to have a baseline household. And the baseline household, uh, in our case, was um, a household of two adults without children, where the um, um, household reference person, uh, what we used to call a head of household, is 52 years old. They have an average income uh, of 20 to uh, 30,000 uh, pounds a year. They own their own home. They have two cars. They are of profession social class. Class. They live in a Dutch house in the southeast rural area, um, and that area has national average characteristics uh, with regards to percentage of private renting, uh, percentage of um, under five year old um, people, and percentage of unoccupied uh, households. Now, that um, type of uh, household, if we move these people, from um, across area poverty, so uh, minus means that they are the more affluent areas, and plus values are uh, the most poor areas, and area poverty had to be standardized for confidentiality reasons, um, of course. So we see that as we move them from uh, the more affluent to uh, the poorest areas, then the red line, which is the burglaries, uh, would increase, understandably, and the the odds of um, having the effective wide security combination uh, would decrease. Okay? So the red line is burglary, um, the odds of burglary, and the blue line is uh, the odds of having the effective wide security combination. This is exactly uh, the same graph as before, but let's assume that these people, well, quite unrealistically, of course, that these uh, people now are uh, council housing tenants. And again, they are able to move, again, um, let's imagine that, from the most affluent area to uh, the most deprived area uh, of the crime survey. Now, if they were uh, council housing tenants, then the odds of having the wide um, security um, is shifts down, decreases, and their odds of uh, being burglared uh, shifts up, uh, increases. And let's add uh, two more unfortunate uh, household characteristics. So this is the case of before, but let's now assume that they um, don't have a car and they are at the lower income um, earning uh, brand. And again, they're able also to live um, anywhere from the most affluent areas to the most deprived areas. And there we see that as they move to the most deprived areas, then their risk of burglary becomes certainty and their odds of um, having this effective combination um, are nearly uh, zero. So to conclude, again, a combination of security devices um, afford more protection. Um, and they have done so over time, but they haven't been invested um, into the population groups that actually need them most. And overall, the white seems to be the most uh, cost-effective um, security uh, combination um, against burglary with entry, especially since 2001-2002. Um, security and burglary risk are, as expected, negatively correlated, both between households and between basic command units, which was um, the area uh, denomination uh, we could use uh, to find enough variation between areas. However, there are population groups that have been um, disproportionately affected by burglary, and um, even more so during the uh, burglary uh, drop. And this is social private renters, uh, lone parents, um, households um, of certain ethnic minority uh, origin, um, households on very low income, less than £10,000 a year, or those where their income was not reported, those without a car, and obviously those uh, living in deprived areas. And as uh, it was observed in the last set of uh, graphs, if we have coinciding risk characteristics, then the inequalities uh, in the crime uh, drop, um, sorry, in burglary risk, um, are compounded. Uh, 
more details about the project can be found um, in the project website, which is uh, still active, uh, I suppose, as well as more information on the previous project um, on the international crime drops and some information on the current project uh, on violence. Thank you. Back to you. Hi, so I'm, I'm going to close. I'm going to move quickly so that hopefully leave a few minutes for questions. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about whether security has caused the violent crime drop, which is a big question, to which the answer is we don't know. But there's more. I'm going to talk about... Um, how we've been mapping out potential hypotheses, thinking about different links between security and violent crime, and identifying potential data sources. We've been chipping away at this for quite some time now, and it's, um, if you're frustrated, imagine how we feel that we haven't quite got to um, the stage of analysis with, with the results that show, show the answers. Um, I think part of that is probably that it's more difficult. It's not as obvious where to get the data, and we're going to have to look much more at different data sources rather than just the crime survey for England and Wales, for different crime types, and different possible relationships. We're going to have to um, be far more imaginative, for want of a better word, we're going to have to identify other sources of information. So it's, I think the whole thing is going to take longer and it's going to um, be messier. And I don't know if... I, I, I'm not saying the research so far has been perfect or perfectly clear, but it's um, going to be tricky. We've started now, we have funding for a project to look at the crime survey for England and Wales in relation to violence, but it's already clear that it's, it's not going to be difficult. A lot of the variables we've started to look at in relation to routine activities and lifestyle aren't as consistent across the survey sweeps as we've found for measures of secu household security and vehicle security, for instance. So it's, it's already not as um, not clear entirely how we're going to progress in terms of looking at how crime's gone down. So, so we're also thinking about other issues. I think there's going to be two broad ways in which security can reduce violence clearly directly, security blocking particular types of violence. Robbery is going to be the, the obvious one. We come to commercial robbery in particular. And then indirectly, and I'm going to spend quite a bit of the time today talking about various indirect possibility where violence falls perhaps as a consequence of, of property security. And I'm going to frame this within, broadly within the notion of within Ron's notion of the diffusion of preventive benefits. So direct effects, possible direct effects of security, and these, these are examples, and I would love other input, and I think we'd be thrilled at this stage if other people begin to take up some of the research and look at these, look at these possibilities. Bank, bank robbery is largely a thing of the past. Uh, I think there's huge potential for developing research into why bank robbery has declined. It's got to be because of security, I think. Um, we haven't got the data on that, but I bet the banking associations have got excellent data on it. And I, I sus you, you would like to think they've tracked the implementation of their security at the branch level. And how, you, if, if you can have the whole banking association, also different um, chains may have introduced security at different levels, and there should be some great research possibilities there. Similarly, for a lot of commercial robbery and commercial store crime from shoplifting, including shoplifting, there should be some great research possibilities. And it's, um, we haven't yet begun to even scratch the surface of this. So anybody else? I would love to see other people jumping onto these possibilities. 
I think um, in the, a couple of pages that Ron wrote with Graham Newman in 2006, they identified a whole list of research hypotheses in relation to the improved management of facilities, leisure and transportation facilities that we now take for granted that may have had potentially significant effects that need to be looked at. I think household security may also have affected violence in, in different ways that aren't immediately, obvi immediately obvious. Domestic violence, we know, we know from the Crime Survey for England and Wales, has gone down dramatically. It, it's um, difficult to link that to security, unless you start to think about the fact that household security may have had an effect. A lot of domestic violence is between separated intimate partners, if he comes round and doesn't find it as easy to kick the door in or to get in through other means, this could have had a, an effect on domestic violence. Similarly, in relation to violence between neighbours and other areas of violence, physical security can have made, made a difference. We have a, um, a range of... There have been studies on different areas already, which I think have show, will have shown some effects. Many years ago, there was a study of uh, buses and the reductions in robbery on buses. And you'll all recognize now that exact fare systems on buses, the drop boxes that mean the cash is no longer available, mean that robbery of bus drivers that used to be relatively common doesn't occur anymore. Similarly, with, with taxes... There was a, a recent study published in Crime Science that suggests that the introduction of cameras in taxes um, in the 1990s in the US brought down taxi driver homicides. There's a range of preventive measures introduced to transportation systems and transport generally that we suspect may have impacted upon violence and disorder in addition to property crimes. So that was a brief look at some possible direct effects and direct relationships between security and also design, I think, and management and reduced violence. Huge potential for research. Now I'm going to talk for a few minutes about potential indirect effects where we've developed some different hypotheses. In particular, mentions, Nick has already mentioned the, the debut crime hypothesis also what we're calling the, um, the keystone hypothesis I'm going to talk about. Um, the analogy is with the keystone of an arch, which is the, the big center stone. If you take that out, the rest of the arch will, will collapse. He's trying to get at the notion that perhaps reduced property crime triggered a fall in violence. We've found, not always, and it's, uh, it's going to be a more complex relationship than this, that the, the decline in violence seems to follow come after the fall in, in property crime. It seems to be the case for violent crime falling after the drop in auto theft in, in, the, in the US. Car crime went down, and it's about a two-year lag to the drop in violence. It, it's a big step to try and make that, the connection, particularly since burglary and other thefts had gone down far earlier in the States. So it's, um, you know, it's not necessarily the case by, by any means that the, these are related but car crime does facilitate many other types of crime if you're stealing a car the people in that stolen car are more likely than other people to be those who when they get there are involved in other types of crime including violence cars are used to facilitate burglary if you're driving to a suburban burglary etc. Many other, other crimes involve cars and similarly burglary has knock-on effects. Yeah, um, um, Marcus Felton called them ja Van Dyke chains after some work that Jan Van Dyke did um, about the, the, the links between different crimes and how one has knock-on effects to others. So if you steal a car, you use it for a burglary. If you commit a burglary, you need to fence the goods. Fence stolen property involves other criminal activity. It involves interacting with criminal others, which may lead to disputes, conflicts, violence, etc. We know that offenders are far more likely to also be victims of crime and violence. So the relationship between these issues is complex. 
I've talked about uh, acquisitive crime, property. Some of the violence is, is that acquisitive crime. There is a body of research on repeat victimization that also shows victims of property crime are those who are more likely to be victims of violent crime. This has been explained largely, to, to date largely in, time, in terms of lifestyle. If you go out more, you're um, more likely to be in situations that facilitate violent crime in pubs and clubs out in the street. And at the same time, your household is more, liable, more exposed to reduced guardianship that may facilitate burglary in some way. Again, I, I'm, I'm alluding to another relationship between property crime risk and violent crime risk. There may be research possibilities to look at reductions in cross-crime cross type repeats. We know that in some instances the reduction in crime has been disproportionately a reduction in repeat victimization, and I think there's, huge poten there's some potential there to look at what's been going on. The debut crime hypothesis is the suggestion that removing crimes that offenders commit early in their careers, shoplifting, car theft, burglary, that they commit as, as learning crimes may mean that they don't proceed on in their career to commit other types of crime, including violence and more serious crimes. There, were, there was a, a study by Owen and Cooper uh, published by the Home Office in the UK that seems to lend some support to this that looked at um, the structure of criminal careers over time and, and the nature of those crimes you commit earlier in your career compared to later in your career. So we've started to begin to look at some of the criminal career literature here and it would be, um, I think, a great link um, a little aside is I think it's uh, interesting to link the criminal careers research with the situational crime prevention security research. Uh, David Farrington many years ago identified already that only a small proportion of offences in criminal careers are violent. Violence overall, as you know, is, is a relatively small proportion of crime. This is this alludes to the notion of taking out the property crime may also have the positive effect of taking out the violent crime. And the same has been found far more recently in a, in a review for the National Institute of Justice by Alex Picaro and colleagues. Finds not a, a, the additional component is that offenders often don't specialise. A, a criminal career is made up primarily of committing property crime with a, a, an add-on of a small amount of, small amount of violent crime. Most of you probably know this being, being criminologists that offenders are, some offenders do specialise, but that tends to be the exception rather, exception rather than the rule. So if you can't be committing the, pro, the property crimes that are the bread and butter of your criminal career, perhaps you don't get to commit the violent crimes either. The interesting thing about this quote is that the note that this includes sex offenders. Sex offenders um, and child sexual abusers are often older, for example. They've learned they can get away with crime from other crimes, and then when their lifestyle progresses to the stage where they perhaps have their own children and interact with other children, they become child sexual abusers. They know they tend to get away with crime. They may commit it. Child sexual offenders and sex offenders generally are, are typically not specialists. Again, it, it's, a, it's a conceptually, I think, a big leap but there's the possibility that removing the property crime even has an impact upon sex offences. And the same for domestic violence. Uh, Richard Wortley has done research with Stephen Smallbone and a range of others on this, where they found the sexual abuse of children is linked to other general criminality factors. Men who already have some experience of serious rule-breaking, dishonesty, exploitation and aggression may be more likely to take the opportunities to sexually abuse a child. This alludes to the notion of both the debut crime hypothesis and the keystone crime hypothesis. A study of domestic violence again shows that, and it's, again it's counterintuitive, 
domestic violence offenders are often not specialists. Prior crimes predict the likelihood of being involved in domestic violence. Prior alcohol and drug crimes predict membership in the high-rate domestic violence arrest trajectory group. Prior domestic violence arrests predict membership in both the low-rate and high-rate non-domestic violence arrest trajectories. So, a lot of work to do, a lot of possibilities. At this age, the safest way might be to say we can't rule out the possibility that security has been in some way involved in the reduction of violence, but we can't show that it, that, that is the case. We've also started some preliminary research looking at um, the, this is age-specific arrest rates from Bureau of Justice Statistics data showing how the reduction in violent crime was disproportionately a drop in youth crime. That's nothing new. Jeff Butts has shown that many years ago. Um, but it fits with the notion of um, how this de the change declines over, over time, over age, sorry. As um, older offenders, the effect has been is less. To us, this suggests that offenders um, who learned their career when crime was at its peak, and there was a lot of easy crime opportunities, are those who now continue to be to offend more relative to offenders of that age now. I don't know if that came across very clearly. Um, so you see how the, the, the lines cross when offenders are in the age in their 40s. So an off offender aged in their 40s now, the a number of offenders per 100,000 population is higher than it was when crime was at its peak. Whereas, for in the teens, the proportion of offenders in the population is far, far lower now. And we think that links to the, the ava overall availability of crime opportunities in the population. If you're 40 now, you learn to commit crime when there was a lot of criminal opportunities. Not a, far from a perfect indicator, Perhaps I'm reading too much into it. We don't know, but it's, it's, um, it's where we're at at the moment. There's a lot of work to do. Uh, I think we very much like input from others and other people to get involved with this research where possible. It's clear that we're to need, we need to begin to use many additional sources of inform information in addition to the crime survey for England and Wales, I think. Um, thank you very much. I think we have some, a few minutes left for questions, if anybody has them, and I will try and facilitate that. Joel. Is. Um, just have one or two questions. Um, one, just, did I understand correctly that in certain neighbourhoods or certain housing types, burglary had gone up? Did I understand that? Burglary has gone up relative to others, not, not in absolute terms. So for everybody, burglary has gone down. Okay. But in relation to others, for certain economic groups, it's gone up. Yeah. Okay. So I guess my question may not be as forceful, but I was wondering whether that was evidence of a displacement effect, but maybe it's not, given what you're saying. No, that's not, it's more concentration, it's not displacement. No. Right. So it's just a Yeah, yeah because a they were thing. always yeah. worse off. So, right. for example, social renters were always worse off uh, compared to owner occupiers, but now much more worse off okay. than before. Well, that makes sense. I, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so there's no displacement. So one, if anything, it's more concentration. Okay. Yeah. Um, just one other thought, and I very much enjoyed the, well, all the presentations, actually. Um, is there a risk in this kind of exploring this securitization hypothesis of kind of uh, being sort of overly inductive um, and not sort of following a Popperian method that we're kind of reaching, reaching, reaching to find these explanations. And I realize this is kind of the hypothesis. This, this is maybe the inductive stage of the research and you ultimately will be in a position to test these more rigorously. But I just, just, I just question that, whether there's a kind of risk of the self-fulfilling prophecy in the way that sort of this, this line of research inevitably unfolds. So that's it. it I, I, it you mentioned it's, Popper, so it should be you. <laughs> it, it's, 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 a, it's a good question. What, what we have tried to do, though, is to see whether the 
outcome signatures conform to what we would expect given the hypotheses that we've formulated. And I guess the case of alarms, the hypothesis that we had, which is that, that alarms would increase um, security, turned out to be falsified. So it's not the case that we've, I think, not been open to the possibility that some of the results go against our expectations. And certainly in relation to alarms, they did go against our expectations. We tried after the event to make sense of it and developed a set of hypotheses there which we'd like to test, but we've not yet been able to do so. We've developed hypotheses which I think are consistent with what's known already, but we don't have any direct evidence to test them. So I think that's consistent with what Popper would like. We're, op we're certainly open to the fact that we're open to the falsification of our, of our, of our hypotheses. And I think we're, we, we welcome critical engagement with what we're trying to do. And I think that will occur as well. I think, we, you know, to some extent we're still in the honeymoon period. Mm. It's, it's going to occur. There's going to be kickback, pushback. Um, you know, our work has involved criticising other people. We, we acknowledge that other people will come and criticise ours. And I think... I think it's natural to pursue and become vested in your research um, and that other people will come along and criticise it, yeah. I think Nick put it much more elegantly. And it's also Please. a crime-type, context-specific approach. So we might find that for certain crime types, it might not, or in certain contexts, it might not be working. But we're, we're still exploring that. Ron, Thanks. and then Ernesto, and then... The word, I have. Did I miss anybody? Um, what is the reaction to your line of research amongst uh, the American researchers that developed the original hypotheses that you were that, that were put forward for the um, crime drop? I, sus I think you probably know that better than me. You were at the National Research Council the week before last, was it? Um, with so <laughs> perhaps you could tell perhaps you could tell us how you were received. <laughs> I'd actually be love to know. Well, the I, when I, I I did appear before this uh, group, the National Research Council or whatever it was, looking at uh, crime trends, I put forward the security hypothesis on your behalf. Um, they seem to think it was okay, but um, they still seem wedded to the more traditional approaches that they've been uh, championing. So I think you've got a lot of work to do to persuade those people anyway. Mm. I think you're right. Yeah, uh, there is a strange anomaly. In Italy, uh, burglary is going up together with Greece. As I remember, also in Greece, only looking to reported crimes because we do not have a victim survey that it's really giving us the idea if they are reporting more or less, but it's a really strange increase in the last two years. Probably between uh, 2013 and 2014 is a stable, but until 2013 has been increasing. Mapping at the burglary scene, city in Trento, there is a, a close connection between uh, the shops uh, by gold, for example, or, it's quite easy to find this connection at situational level. So it's a strange anomaly. I remember in Greece also there should be the same trend. Is connected because people are reporting more? I doubt. Or because strange anomaly in, uh, against the, the trend of other European countries? I think our experience, if I understood you correctly, is, is consistent with that. There are, there's definitely examples of areas, the crime types that are increasing, you know, internet-related crime, I think it fits with the theoretical framework of, of crime opportunity theory, where there's, where there's a change in the opportunity structure. I think you mentioned gold being sold, which is a function of the, the um, austerity with gold prices went up, didn't they? It's going to, be, it's going to become a more attractive target, and it makes perfect sense. And so I don't know exactly the pattern of crimes in Italy, but... Theoretically, it fits. We, I don't, we don't, we've never had any problem with some crimes going up and some going down. That suggests that we need to do situational approaches towards other crime types. 
in addition, uh, when crime is going down, we would expect more reporting crime to be recorded because the police has more time in their hands, and that's something uh, Jan van Dijk has uh, written about. So for stable situation, we would expect under a crime drop situation to find um, initially an increase in the police recorded crime uh, because they have more time in their hands to um, investigate crimes they wouldn't deal before when they had lots of um, a high, higher workload. And then after some time, uh, we find a drop. And that has been evidenced um, for about seven countries, including the UK and the US. Um, and that's in a book on the international crime drops with Jan and Graham. Um, yes, okay, uh, my name is Jaap de Waard. I uh, work at the Ministry of Security and Justice. And I, I have no question, but uh, just a remark, uh, I think I, I have to congratulate you with, with the fine work you have done over the past years. Um, not only from a practical point of view, this is highly relevant, but also for, from a policy uh, view, this is really highly relevant. And this is, I think, what this symposium is all about, to try to bridge the gap between research and policy. And uh, the work you've done over the last six years is, has indeed uh, been quite influential in the Netherlands. So I, I want to thank you for all the work being done. I think this is highly relevant. Um, Yesterday I did a presentation and, well, it is quite similar as a couple of graphs I've seen uh, from your side. I already have been going through your work, uh, uh, doing uh, some desk research, and I would very much would like to share uh, our data from the Netherlands, which looks quite similar. We do now some secondary analysis on our victimization survey on your security protective factor. So thanks very much for, uh, well, the good work you've done so far, and uh, I hope you will succeed uh, with the gap between uh, explain, explaining why violence has, has declined. Well, I have some suggestions for you what kind of uh, data you can use. So, uh, again, thanks very much for Excellent. your good work. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you so Thank much you. for that. Um, it's warming. You get, you get a surprising little feedback in academia, and it's wonderful to hear from a policymaker that you're research is useful and that, it's um thank you very much and i would love to hear about the suggestions for furthering the research It'd be excellent any others we're at the time limit but then thank you very much